informed and does what? With the testimony. The FYI. Right. Those are those those are all night stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Those are and left again and then got dragged back I Good seeing you again. Good seeing you. We need to get a chair for the man. That makes sense. Oh, no, he is on so much for a six o'clock. I know. You're gonna leave some lights down there. Yeah. I heard I missed the marathon. Oh, I was in there. Cheers. Oh my God. You're doing somebody's job. Yeah, I'm there. Like I said, you know, you're right. That is. That is. Yes, yes. That is. Actually. Except it was. Sorry, we right, win. <laughs>
Good evening and welcome to tonight's public meeting of the 2019 New York City Charter Vision Commission. I am Gail Benjamin, the chair of the commission, and I am joined by the following members. To my left is Allison Hirsch and Lisette Camillo. To my right, my far right, is uh, the Honorable Steve Fiella, Sal Albanese, Dr. Lillian Barrios Paoli, and Jim Karras. And directly next to me is my counsel, David Seitzer. Today, we will continue the commission series of expert forums on the focus areas we adopted in January. This evening, we are privileged to be joined by a distinguished set of panelists put together in consultation with my fellow commissioners who have generously agreed to speak to us about chief diversity officers as well as corruption and conflicts of interest in city government. We very much look forward to delving into these important topics with our panelists. Additionally, although several individuals who were invited to speak about the management of the city's pension funds were unable to be here tonight, we will be soliciting written comments from, from them and reaching out as we normally do with any questions that we do not have a chance to ask at the forum. With that, let's get started Madam with our Chair, first. We have the privilege of the floor. I'd like to just make a few comments about the pension panel that disappeared today, that evaporated. I can't finish, can I? Sorry? I, I, I can't finish, can I? You can finish. I thought you finished. I think no. About, oh, I'm sorry. When, when you're done, I'd just like to make a few comments. Just a few. Each panelist will have three minutes to provide brief opening remarks, and then we'll have 30 minutes for commissioner questions. If 30 minutes ends up not being enough time to get to your question, just let staff know and they will arrange follow-up afterwards. For brevity's sake, I'm going to call up the witnesses, but I'll ask each of them to more fully introduce themselves when they give their statements. On this first panel, we have Janelle Doris, Wendy Garcia, John Pinnock, the Reverend Jacques Andre de Graff, and Andrea Bowen. And I would now like to rep recognize uh, Sal Albanese, who has a few very brief comments. Well, about a minute or so, a minute and a half. I think it's important, Madam Chair. I, I, okay. I, I, uh, I just like to say I'm disappointed in the fact that uh, we had a pension reform panel along with the other issues tonight, and for some reason the uh, the Bureau of Asset Management that was scheduled to attend here tonight and was actually agreed to attend in the afternoon today said that they couldn't make it, they had other business to attend to. Now, uh, as you know, I've written an op-ed piece about pension reform and, and the importance of overhauling our pension plan in New York City because it is, it, it is a, a, as the former controller, John Lou said, it's a clunker of a plan. Mayor Bloomberg also agreed. And I think we, had an op we, we have an obligation to at least air it out. funds and we needed an opportunity to ask him questions about how that pension plan is working with five different plans consultants up the Gazoo underperforming the Canadians by two and a half percent every single year yet I think it's disrespectful for, for his staff not to be here and certainly disrespectful for him not to be here today he was on the air talking about the diversity office the chief diversity officer which I think is a great idea which he has no jurisdiction over but yet in the area where he's responsible for our pension plan, and of course, when you when you when you take on an issue like pension reform, there's always you're going to take a little fire. He's missing in action, and so is his staff. So I'm disappointed. I, I want to thank the staff for doing whatever they could to bring everybody everybody in. And I'm going to, I will ask the staff to do some additional research on this topic and, and, and come up with, uh, with a deep dive on, uh, on pension reform in New York City, uh, because I think we need it. The, the employees of the city, the taxpayers of the city, 
Um, the retirees depend on the system. We're contributing $10 billion a year. That's only going to grow as baby boomers retire. So I know it's a politically tough issue, but that's what you get paid for as an elected official. So he should not be missing in action as he is today. So, but I, I'm going to continue to press that we address this issue. Thank you, Sal. I know, and I thank you for your comments and your understanding. We have tried. Um, the controller called me and said that they would not be able to make it. I have no way to compel persons, as you know, to be here. Um, we will try to find another way to go about doing this. Um, and you have my commitment to try and make Thank that you. happen. I'd like to know what was more important than, than the Bureau of Asset Management not to attend. They, would they have a cheerleading yeah, event tonight? What, what was going on? It's just a, uh, I don't know how to turn this on. When the green light is on. Okay, is this on? Oh, there it is. Um, it's my understanding that the chief investment officer for the Comptroller's Office and for the City of New York is actually out of town tonight, and so they control want. the chief investment officer. What about him? Is out of town tonight, and the reason the he so and he is the most appropriate person to testify on this issue, given what his portfolio is. And so it's my understanding the controller and the chief investment officer offered to find another day if it's all possible, but scheduling didn't work, is my mm -hmm. understanding. But regardless, that's, we that's not what it. staff said. I'm sorry. And and the chief investment officer should not have been out of town because they agreed to testify. They agreed to testify weeks ago on this date. And, and all of a sudden, they're out of town? I, I don't buy it. I'm sorry. With that, I thank everyone around the table for their understanding. We now have a quorum um, with the addition of Satish Nuri. And so I would like to entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of the Commission's meeting of March 11th held here at BMCC, a copy of which has been provided to all of the commissioners. Do I hear a motion? Second? Second. Um, discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion, the motion, I thought you were raising your hand, Sal. No, no, no. <laughs> the motion carries. Um, Mr. Uh, Janelle Jarris, would you like to start? Move it closer, closer than you ever thought possible. Thank you. Uh, good evening uh, to the New York City Charter Revision Commissioners, esteemed co-panelists. Uh, my name is John L. Doris. I'm the Senior Advisor and Director of the Mayor's Office of MWBEs. Today I want to provide an overview of the citywide MWBE program, uh, the program's goals, as well as an overview of the structure and accountability uh, within our office that ensures our commitment to diversity in the city's procurement process. In fall of 2016, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the creation of the Mayor's Office of MWBEs as a critical next step to in the administration's commitment to increasing contract and opportunities for minority and women entrepreneurs. The Mayor pledged ambitious goals of achieving 30 percent of MWBE utilization by 2021 and having 9,000 certified businesses by the end of 2019. In 2015, the mayor also outlined the one NYC goal of $16 billion to go to MWBEs in the next 10 years. And also uh, last year, he raised that goal to $20 billion since we were ahead about $1.8 billion of our projections. We are also excited to have the leadership of Deputy Mayor uh, Phil Thompson, who career-long justice and equity work includes increasing economic opportunities for disadvantaged uh, individuals and challenging structural and historical barriers in the marketplace and within government. Under the supervision of the Deputy Mayor, our office, SBS Mox, we play an integral, integral role in implementing oversight for the MWBE program. The purpose of the city's program really is to remedy the discrimination of past, uh, past discrimination in the city's procurement. Uh, this impact is statistically analyzed in the disparity study. I want to skip ahead for time purposes. Um, since we are here tonight to really talk about the Chief Diversity Officer, we wanted to give a little update on where we are. Uh, since the start of this administration, the, the city was at 8% utilization. Uh, we are uh, last year, at the end of fiscal year 18, we were at 
19 percent. Uh, so it's more than doubled where we started at the beginning of this administration. And last year alone, we did $3.7 billion in utilization uh, for MWBEs when it comes to contracting. Uh, we are not there yet, and uh, we know going forward, uh, we will have to continue to work closely with our elected partners, uh, members of this commission, certainly our colleagues on this panel, to help move uh, the agenda forward for MWBEs. Uh, I would also like to say that we didn't just uh, change uh, rules in the city, which we have, and made adjustments to policies and procedures to ensure that MWBEs are able to participate. We actually went to Albany to get state law changed so that we can increase opportunity here at the city level. And since we've done that, raising our discretionary threshold uh, by state law, changing state law, uh, from 20,000 to 150,000, we were able to move in a very short span of time of a few months, uh, set over 750 contracts to MWBEs worth about 56 million. So we're committed to making the necessary changes, lobbying where needed, and certainly look forward to hearing from the commission today uh, your concerns concerning the CDO position. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Doris. Wendy Garcia, take your mic back. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Charter Revision Commission for allowing me to testify today. My name is Wendy Garcia, and I'm the Chief Diversity Officer for the Office of the Controller. And I'm here to call on the Charter Revision Commission to end the status quo on exclusion and put Chief Diversity Officer on the ballot for November. As many of you already know, there are multiple programs around the city that already address income inequality for women and people of color. Some may say that programs, these programs are enough. But we have found in our analysis time after time again that those programs don't have the systemic oversight and sustainability that they need to be successful. A chief diversity officer will set the tone at the very top for inclusion and it will create a five borough economy that represents the diversity of the city. For example, Local Law 1, which sets contracting goals across agencies, focuses solely on business owners and lacks accountability. Of the 6,700 certified MWBEs, only 20% of those firms receive payments from the city contracts. We also found that in 2015, more than 60% of those agencies failed to submit subcontracting information to the city's PIP system as required. And without this information, agencies cannot hold primes accountable for their contracting scopes, disproportionately impacting MWBEs. In addition, as you heard my colleagues say earlier this week, we found that 69% of MWBE contracts are submitted late to registration, delaying their payments and forcing many of the businesses out. To raise this issue, you need a CDO who reports to the top. If you look at the new Office of Citywide Equity and Inclusion, whose focus is employment and diversity, the head of that office lacks the reporting structure needed for real influence. And while I believe the current commissioner supports this office mission, the office needs to be elevated to ensure that the next commissioner takes this seriously. Of the handful of agencies that have CDOs, a few report to the top and they're already seeing results. For example, if you look at the Department of Design and Construction, they increased their MWB spending by more than 100 million since 2014. This is key because studies have found that chief diversity officers who do not report to the top are really set up to fail, in turn impacting communities of color and women. My role, which is an executive level position, ensures that the city uses its financial power from contracts to investment to level the playing field. For example, we took an honest look at the Comptroller's Office procurement and we created a strategy to almost triple our spending with MWBs from 11% to 29%. And we pushed global companies to add directors from various backgrounds. In fact, 49 companies we targeted have elected 59 new directors who identify as women and people of color. As you can see, this issue is bigger than Local Law 1. We need to enshrine it in the Charter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Garcia. Uh, Don Pinnock. Thank you. Good evening, members of the New York City Charter Commission and tonight's panelists. I'm Dawn Pinnock, and I proudly serve as the Executive Deputy Commissioner of People Operations and Risk Management at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, known as DCAS. 
I'm pleased to have an opportunity to testify today to inform you of the work that the Office of Citywide Equity and Inclusion does to foster workplace diversity, equity, and inclusion across the city. In line with the city charter, OCEI's mission is to enable city agencies to comply with the city's equal employment opportunity policy and charter revisions and laws concerning equal employment opportunity. Under the leadership of a chief equity and inclusion officer, which works directly with mayoral agencies, we conduct monitoring and we ensure citywide compliance with policy reporting and training requirements. Additionally, under Local Law 12, which was enacted in January of this year, which memorializes OCEI's current structure, it calls for the creation of a diversity and inclusion office within DCAS, to which agencies are accountable, and the appointment of a chief to lead this work, and specific reporting requirements to highlight the city's efforts to address workforce inequities. The city's municipal workforce includes over 390,000 employees who provide essential services to New Yorkers. We are a minority majority with women representing 59% of the city's workforce and people of color comprising 62%. We are a civil service municipality, whereby 83% of our positions are filled through civil service testing and 95% of our workforce are represented by unions whose salaries are codified in collective bargaining agreements. Pursuant to the city's EEO policy, EEO officers report directly to an agency head. DCAS's chief equity and inclusion officer works directly with these officers to ensure citywide compliance with respect to EEO and equity. The chief participates in the vetting process for these officers, provides orientation and investigative support, and hosts monthly meetings, mandatory meetings with these officers serving across the city. The Office of Citywide Equity and Inclusion also provides a host of tools, including mandatory training and a 24-hour accessible information portal. The chief also reports regularly to City Hall regarding citywide policy, training, and compliance. Given the nature of civil service, OCEI also focuses on pipeline development prior to the administration of civil service exams. We issue quarterly reports to our EEO officers specifically for the purposes of hosting targeted recruitment efforts to ensure that their workforce and workplace is diverse. There is a specific focus on underserved communities, including people with disabilities, the LGBTQ community, and people of color. We've also partnered with the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities to connect people with disabilities to civil service careers. Through this partnership, we've hosted the first city's diversity job fair, its first symposium for HR and EEO professionals, and we're offering disability etiquette training to educate all employees on ways to engage with people with disabilities. I thank you for the opportunity to testify this evening and look forward to hearing more about this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Pinnock. Um, Reverend DeGraff. Good evening, Commission. Thank you for this opportunity and to join these distinguished co-panelists. Uh, in plain talk, it's not working and we're disappointed. Good people are, are achieving things, but the reality is this. The next mayor could come in and with the stroke of a pen eliminate all the progress you've heard thus far. We believe the progress needs to be institutionalized through a CDO for the City of New York. The Federal Reserve has a CDO, CBS has a CDO, the Nielsen Company has a CDO, and I was part of that effort for over 10 years. Why am I saying that? Because the private sector has already recognized that having diversity is good for business. And we need people installed in office who every day see this as their responsibility. There's a chief legal counsel, you have your lawyer right with you. Uh, other places have a chief financial officer and they worry about the money. We need someone who is a gatekeeper and a, a watchdog over opportunity for the city of New York. And when the city allows MBEs and WBEs to be a full part of the life of the city, then jobs are created and wealth is created in our communities. But we need the city, a CDO who can do more and speak with the authority, not only of a, a charter sanctioned position, but also with the authority to call commissioners on the carpet so that when primes don't pay subs, somebody can intercede. Right now, you can win a contract and lose your business because there's no one to speak up on behalf of the firms that win the opportunities. And as a point in fact, despite all the, the great numbers, black and brown communities are watching the gravy train of economic development pass us by. This is unacceptable. I am a past MWBE Advocate of the Year from the City of New York, nominated by the Building Trades. I chaired the Diversity Council of the School Construction Authority, the city's most successful program, and uh, 
that accounted for more than a third of its MWBE spend. I know what I'm talking about. And I know that unless there is sanctioned leadership with authority, and we just don't want a CDO, we want a funded office, and we want funded staff in each agency because we need to get results that are, that are accountable to the people that we serve. It cannot be from administration to administration. We have a historic opportunity. I'm old enough to remember when we had a board of estimate, and there were a lot of backroom deals, and it was, it was an old boys club. Careful, because I sat on the board of estimate. Excuse me? I sat on the board of estimate. Well, okay. Well, you were young. I was a boy, and I wasn't making backroom were, deals. You were a prodigy, but, but for, the, for the rest of us, it was a way of business that, that was not always done in public. There were a lot of things that happened out of the public view. We want to take this moment in history to open the door of opportunity in the city of New York and to continue to be a leader in public policy and the national position that we occupy. Thank you for this opportunity, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Reverend DeGraff. And now, Andrea Bowen. Is that mic Is working now? Nope. Let's do this one. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Chair Benjamin and members of the NYC Charter Commission. My name is Andrea Bowen, and I'm principal of Bowen Public Affairs Consulting. I'm a transgender woman and advocate for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, and intersex community. Um, and I currently engage in policy articulation, advocacy, and implementation around LGBTQI and primarily transgender issues. Um, uh, I previously submitted comments to the Charter Commission, co-signed by several organizations, and they're at the back of my testimony. Um, and those form the basis of my recommendations around the proposed uh, Chief Diversity Officer, um, or CDO. Um, uh, I primarily work on issues around the transgender, gender non-conforming, and non-binary community, as we increasingly call it. And so, but I'm just going to say trans for short even though it's TGNC and BMI um, testimony. Um, so uh, any CDO position should not limit its purview to procurement, as is the focus of the comptroller's proposal, um, but should view its mandate as pushing for inclusion of women minorities, including, including trans people, across a variety of city activities. Um, New York City CDOs should ensure inclusion in city agency hiring, as do CDOs in other municipalities. Um, uh, well, the city of San Francisco, the take one, doesn't have a CDO. It has several offices that focus on um, different uh, minorities. Um, uh, and so their Office of Transgender Initiatives informs about procurements, but also like housing um, and other issues under the sun. Um, and, uh, you know, I was looking at uh, San Antonio, Texas's chief equity officer, which oversaw an effort to embed racial equity in city operations and services. So that's pretty expansive. Um, so NYCD's CDO, NYC's CDO should have as ex expansive a mandate as possible in overseeing expansion of economic opportunity in subject areas within the city's purview. Um, if a particular contract focuses on a particular community, such as trans people or the LGBTQI community at large, CDOs should actively recruit organizations led by members of that community and also help organizations become competitive for city contracts. Um, I work, again, with a lot of trans organizations, and I know from working with them that they're eager to take on city projects but don't have the know-how or don't know when procurements happen. And so I'd like to see sort of greater technical assistance and um, outreach to make sure those organizations are brought in line. Um, CDOs should have the responsibility of ensuring that contracts that impact a particular community um, are scored at least in part by community members from that particular community. So um, again, like if you have something that impacts the LGBTQI community, it should be scored by the LGBTQI people. And I'd like a CDO to emphasize that. Um, to ensure effectiveness of proposed CDOs, they should be required to produce regular public reports um, on agency hiring and procurement awarded to protected classes under NYC, the NYC law. Um, and uh, finally, um, and this is sort of CDO adjacent, um, I would like to see the charter have a re hiring requirement that at least 1% of city agency jobs go to the trans community, considering its um, historical rates of discrimination, and that charter language be crafted not only for that community, but others who are similarly disadvantaged. Um, thank you for your time, and I appreciate it. Any questions you have? Thank you all very much. Um, we're now going to open up the floor for Commissioner quest questions. Um, once again, if you don't have time to get to something you wanted to ask, just let one of the <coughs> staff know and they'll be more than happy to follow up with the panelists after the forum if we run out of time. Um, the first person with a question is Jim Karras. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. 
thank you, everyone. Uh, given that there are, you know, we have a DCAS office that is responsible for uh, diversity hiring, a mayoral office that's responsible for MWBE, we have the EEPC, I believe, uh, is there a pay equity office, gender, gender equity. equity office as well? Are we talking, I mean, I'm asking you guys your opinion. Are we talking about creating a charter office for MWBs, or should we be talking about restructuring and consolidating? Uh, because it seems like we have a lot of offices doing various aspects of the same diversity issue. Who, who was the question to? All of us? <laughs> Uh, well, f first of all, thank you for the question. Uh, the, there are a lot of programs that you just described that are with this administration. The, the fact of the matter is we're looking ahead to what, what the next years would bring, and they need to be institutionalized. Some of the MWBE programs will be brought under a CDO, but the, the, the diversity and inclusion are a larger issue than just compliance with local laws. They are also way makers, making things happen. So, for instance, in the example that I gave earlier about the subcontractor who didn't get paid, or to help developers put their compliance plan and work plan in order, the, order, the, the office is a get-it-done office and make it happen. By that means it's not a passive gotcha office. It's, a, it's an office that's collaborative to work with the entities that deal with government and government to include all of the, the elements of our society. And, and just very quickly to add to that, what a, the role of a chief diversity officer is really to see the pattern of discrimination across all agencies. And what we are succinctly asking for is that we have one in the mayor's office that can look at the EO office, that can look at the MWB program and pick up those patterns and come up with proactive solutions to address the gaps. The second part of that is to charter mandate CDOs inside of city agencies. And as you all know, you've been all in government for a long time. When we charter something into an agency, we know that the next commissioner and the following commissioner will have it. We don't, we don't stand the risk of losing the concept of diversity and inclusion. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Cadera, uh, and I assume you would like to add your vote to the uh, adoption of the minutes from March 11th. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Thank you, and thank you for your question. Um, as I closed my testimony, that was one of the questions that I, you know, actually um, had as well, because as we look at our current system, there's a great deal of overlap in terms of what is in the current proposal and what is happening really at the agency level from a workplace and workforce equity perspective. And so while we certainly support the spirit in which the proposal is written, there would need to be some very clear conversation and parameters around where these responsibilities sit. Because currently we have a recent local law that was passed that specifically states that DCAS should really serve as the home for workplace equity and inclusion work. And we've been able to yield solid results you know, as a result of that placement. In addition to training um, city employees in less than a year, 330,000 employees on sexual harassment creating standardized procedures across every agency, creating standardized codes of conduct, working with MOPD to create a pathway for people with disabilities into civil service, which for those of us who know about civil service, it can be quite daunting and complex for individuals. Um, we've been able to yield results you know, with having the Office of Citywide of Equity and Inclusion, specifically a DCAS. We also serve as a central hub for all workforce data that is released across the city. So, so similar to the question that you've posed, that would be something that we'd be interested in learning more about as this proposal develops. May I just add one additional, because I think, I think she brings up a good point and a lot of people are raising that question. I would actually argue the work is not overlapping. I think you have agencies doing work in silos. And that is an issue that city agencies have across the board, where you have one agency not talking to another agency, not speaking to another agency. A CDO will bring that all together. It will say to whoever the mayor is, hey, I'm seeing a pattern. 
in EEO and there's some regulations that we need to change. I'm seeing a pattern in the MWB program and there's some regulations that we need to change. And when we know when we elevate that to the top, top it is, there is a much more aggressive push on that issue. The same thing would happen at the agency level. If there are bureaus within an agency that are not doing what they are supposed to do, or there is a agency policy change that needs to happen, only a CDO can look across every single deputy commissioner and say, it's time to make a change and fix this issue. Can I just add? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, commissioners. Um, so I, I think we, we echo the concern about the proposal and certainly the um, redundancy or uh, the unsurety of how it would sit and work with, with others. Currently, there is Local Law 1 that mandates MWB officers at the deputy commissioner level, meaning reporting directly into the commissioner and also mandate a citywide MWBE director, which currently is a deputy mayor, Deputy Mayor Thompson, so directly reported into the mayor. The mayor created our office um, and appointed myself senior advisor and the director of that office, first ever in the city's history. And um, we've seen MWB utilization jump from 8% to 19% in a matter of a year and a half or so, and we continue to grow. So when we talk about sustainability, I, we hear the concern, and this is all of our work, by the way. I mean, everyone at this table, these are my colleagues. We, we're in, in, in New York City, and we're in Albany working on this as well. Um, the challenge is, is that we're looking at this proposal because we want to understand fully how it changes the construct that is already there. There's direct reporting. There's mandated quarterly meetings that we have with every single commissioner and every MWB officer. There are monthly ACL meetings where we participate in. There's ongoing training. There's procurement uh, improvement plans mandated, submitted to the council uh, every uh, year about what those, and there's accountability at the end on that. So we are, uh, again, um, supportive, of course, of diversity. That's why we're all here. That's what we work in. But we are, you know, concerned about how this will be um, administered uh, with the current construct that we already have mandated already in law. And just to, as somebody who hangs out in lots of rooms with community organizers on a regular basis, um, it's really hard to point community members to people who are accountable. Um, like I seriously tried making a spreadsheet like for like people who are relevant to the trans community who you should talk to and agencies who have purview over things. If there was like one person who was responsible for a lot of contracting and like city agency hiring and like things related to diversity that like we could go to as like a sole source. Um, I think that, and like who's like dealing with like intersectional issues as like all of like our issues are. Um, I think that would be really, really powerful, especially from a community empowerment perspective. Madam Chair, can I, can I interject? It's just Reverend one DeGraff. Piece, and that is this. We're spending, I would hope that the commission would consider that good people are making good efforts, but they have inadequate tools. But the results for black and brown communities are unsatisfactory. And when you hear uh, my distinguished colleague talk about a 10-year plan, the mayor is only going to be here for eight years. So we don't know about those other two out years. It depends. It depends on what happens. We need this to be institutionalized because stuff happens. At agencies, some agencies there's a direct report. Other agencies report to the, uh, the MWBE director reports through the ACO. And so there gets to be a status quo uh, and not a turnover or an inclusion at those agencies. It has to be the mandate of, 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 of positions created by statute and by vote of the public is what will empower change in New York. We're at a historic crossroads, and you have the opportunity to open the door for progress in our communities. I have a question. Can this be done by legislation, and have you sought such legislation? Could I, could I, just, I would say no, because the charter is what constitutionalizes how the city is governed. Right. And what a CDO would do is you would be changing at this point how we view the governance of the city. 
I want to talk just a little bit about systemic racism. And we know that a lot of the ways that we are doing business now are based on 30 and 40 years ago. We need someone at the top who can take the microscope, who can go through all those rules and regulations, who can go through all the operations and say, how do we change this and fix this to do this differently? Legislation all depends on who would like to introduce it. A charter says... I, I, I didn't catch that. I'm sorry? I didn't catch what you just said. The last sentence. We oh, hear I'm it. sorry. Legislation is really based on whoever introduces it. What the charter does is that it sets... It, it sets a tone that the city is serious about this, and it sets a tone that the city is, is focused on pushing diversity, not just in procurement, not just in EEO, but on regulatory and compliance matters as well. Okay. But could it be done by legislation? I understand your preference. There, there have been saying... efforts to do it by legislation, and there have been those who have compromised it along the way. And that is why we were pursuing the will of the people and that expression through a charter vote rather than through legislation. There have been many, many efforts, and there are some CDOs who exist, and they are really public relations offices, community relations offices. We need it codified by the will of the people in a, a public vote. Sal, you're next. Yeah, I, I think uh, Reverend DeGraff uh, uh, makes uh, a compelling point. I, what you're looking for is basically codifying this in, in, uh, in the charter instead of getting into the weeds here about what's happening. And since there are some good things happening now, and maybe they're, uh, in the future they may not be as good. But if it's in the charter, it's part of our government governance process, which is uh, what you're seeking, I believe. Uh, correct? Yeah. But part, part of it, when we fought in Local Law 1, we fought to have CDOs included. The mayor's office at that time chose to say that that would be an intrusion from the legislative branch into the executive branch. They didn't want city council dictating positions in city hall. So this is uh, a way that, the, the, to the heart of your question, that's been tried and, and, and has not reached fruition. This is the way that we believe it will reach lasting fruition and produce meaningful results over time. Uh, just one quick question, Reverend DeGraff. On, uh, I know the state uh, has done a pretty good job, especially at the New York State Dormitory Authority, in terms of uh, MWBE contracts. Are they doing something different than the city's doing, or, uh, or more, they're more effective uh, than the city? They, or? Well. The, 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 the fact of the matter is that the CDO for the state of New York is Governor Cuomo. Um, and so is what? He, I'm sorry. the governor is, in fact, the CDO for New York State. He actually, in those quarterly meetings, he's attended. He attends those meetings. And, and woe be to the commissioner who's falling short of their goals. It, it flows from the top. And in, in, in this instance, by putting it in the city charter, that officer would have the authority not only of the mayor's office, but of the will of the people. So we need people who can call commissioners on the carpet. We need people who can study data, but also look at the implications and not only be a, address problems, but be problem solvers. And that's really, there are a lot of folk who, who you've heard this before, we've never done that before. Or the other enemy of progress, we've always done it this way. We need people who can help the agencies think outside the box. The good people in government who want to bring about change need this help to get them to accomplish the goals that you've heard right. about. Take Cuomo out of the equation. Is there anything in the state constitution or in, in, in the state law that mandates or has uh, some reference to a chief diversity officer? No, there's not, there's not in state law, but the, the state has been more aggressive in, in interpreting the disparity studies, which are the legal underpinning for any executive or preferential program. Thank you. Can, can I just add one thing? I, I think, um, you know, we, wanna, we want everyone to know that I think the fact that, um, you know, we're in this business is because we are very much concerned about uh, <coughs> The disparities that we see. I mean, this is not some something we're just um, looking over or not holding agencies accountable. Our office was created for this purpose. Um, it's embedded and enshrined in law already. Again, MWB officers uh, who are uh, direct reports. We're not talking about MWBE staff that may be working, uh, but there's also a deputy commissioner level, mandated by Local Law 1, that is an MWBE officer. 
Also, the citywide MWB director is a direct report into the mayor. All this is uh, already, in our context, in the law. We've already also seen change and transition uh, in changing procedures, in changing laws, in changing our goal setting processes, changing how we interpret the, uh, the local law one. Uh, we, we are in a process of updating local law one, the goals, et cetera, uh, to match our disparity study. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, we want to be sure that we're doing everything that we can at this moment to do that. And I, I believe, um, you know, there's, there's more to be done, and we're doing it. I understand that, but do you support codifying this in the city charter? That's the question. I mean, I, I know what you're doing, and it sounds like you're doing some pretty good work, but I think the essence of this panel is about codifying this in the city charter. I, I mean, um, are, are you for it or against that? I think I think we are here to hear the concerns uh, from the from the commissioners. I think we're here to hear concerns of my colleagues. Okay. What we're saying is that we we're 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 exploring it and just trying to discover: Are we being duplicative here? Are we doing the same thing that's already being done? So, you, I mean, you, that's so you don't have a position on it. Is basically what you're telling me. I think we're in exploratory mode this time. Okay. I, I, I um, want to be wait, very, wait, wait. Go ahead, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Um, If you're, why did you limit this to mayoral agencies then? Why not include the controller or the, the borough presidents or the council or anybody else? Why only mayoral agencies? Well, it would be all, it would be, it would be all agencies. Uh, no, the, it says mayoral. It would be a mayoral office. All, I'm saying it's, it would be all agencies. I, I, I no. So, right. Would you oppose I, I'm being, sorry. Can, go ahead. Reese, sorry. I, this my, I mean, the way it's drafted right now is that there's an off, my understanding of the way it's drafted right now is that there's a high level uh, appointment in the office of the mayor and in all of the mayoral controlled agencies. Yes. So the question I think, so I, I guess a different way to phrase the question, which is probably not the way Chair Benjamin would phrase it, but I will phrase it, is there, it, would you be open to expanding it to other agencies? Is there a, a non-mayoral entities in the city? Is there a reason why they were excluded? The controller, the public advocate, etc. Yes, absolutely. We would be open to expanding it. Um, I think the position, the, the, the essence of the position is that we need chief diversity officers at institutions across government that can help elevate the issue of both hiring and procurement and policy and regulation issues so that they can sit there and talk to the top and deregulate anything that's causing discrimination. That being said, so thank you for clarifying. I, sorry. Yeah, um, I, I, when I was, I was responding just to the comptroller's uh, proposal, but on what Reverend DeGraff said, when I was looking over it, I was like, I was looking not only at the comptroller's proposal, but also the proposal to have independent budgeting. And I was thinking about like, well, if we want to have something really protected from like political influence, I mean like the influence of the mayor and like shifting with political winds within administrations, like wouldn't it be awesome to actually have it outside the mayor's office with an independent budget? That was just one thing that was occurring to me as I was writing testimony. <laughs> the issue is, the, the fact of the matter is, in, in our form of government, this, uh, the executive branch proposes the budget. And therefore, the, the, that's where the sway is, and that's why the focus has been on the executive branch, uh, the, the, this office existing within the executive branch. And I, I just want to set the record straight, because it, it might have seemed to some who are the uninitiated that uh, in any of the remarks that have been said, that we want to recognize the contributions of but, uh, Reverend Doris and, 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 and Dawn and the entities that they represent, because they have come a quantum leap from where we were uh, a number of years ago when this administration came in. Uh, it was nearly flatlined in terms of MWBE participation. So I don't want to, I don't want in this moment to, to sound like we're throwing the baby without with the bathwater. We couldn't have this moment but for the work that they've done. Because the reality is that progress has enemies. And so status quo is, is, is in every institution by definition. And so I want to recognize their contribution because their contribution brought us to the point where we can have these aspirations because we know that there are good people like this in government. Thank you. 
I just wanted to clarify um, a couple of things. And so um, from our perspective, from a workplace and workforce equity perspective, you know, a lot of what's been mentioned today is really already in place. There is a clear system of accountability between the DCAS chief equity and inclusion officer and these EEO officers who report to every agency head across the city. And so when we talk about silos and not being able to speak to the breadth of work that's happening across the city, that's actually not where we currently sit. In addition to having monthly mandatory best practices meetings where we meet with our EEO officers, we share citywide trends, we look at complaint data to see if there are any trends and any um, best practices that can be implemented to help us work together better as a city. In addition to that, with training, we've also built in clear escalation processes up to the deputy mayors where they are following up with agency heads, specifically relating to training and reporting compliance and any policy changes that we're seeking to make. And so I just wanted to point that out because I, I do understand, you know, the spirit of the proposal. But once again, I do think that clarification as to where roles would reside, given where we currently are, really needs to be fleshed out. Thank you very much. Can I just ask a, a follow-up question to that? Because I appreciate that. Is the the coordination, the cross-agency coordination that you engage in? Um, is there any reason not to codify that in the charter given, I mean, is that, do you see that as a clear mandate from the law or as something that is both, as both a function of Local Law 12 but also of the current leadership and the current commissioner, the current mayor? Like, do you think that, I guess my question is, what is the downside to codifying that level of coordination at the highest level in the charter? Based on what I know of the proposal, I would not necessarily say that I see a very clear downside, but once again, I do think that clarification needs to happen. We do see that monthly engagement with our EEO officers as an extension of Local Law 12. We also see it as our obligation to ensure that this city is working better and that we are looking at our data to really drive how we recruit, how we get ahead of uh, our civil service testing process to ensure that at the time that we're making selections that we are selecting a diverse group of individuals that reflect the diversity of the city. So I don't necessarily see a clear downside, but I think that's all the more reason why there's clarification required. Thank you. The fact of the matter is that history didn't begin with the de Blasio administration. The 12 years immediately preceding that, and then the eight years preceding that, was, was MWB participation nearly flatlined in New York City. So there's 20 years versus the last few years, which uh, to the point is why it should be codified, because we don't know what the future holds. But we can write the future with your efforts by including the position to be codified in the charter revision uh, that's coming up in the fall. Uh, no, I was just uh, going to thank Reverend Graff for his uh, kind words, and uh, certainly we can't do it without him um, and, and advocates. Uh, you know, we we came into a situation, and he did. He's making it very clear that uh, the program um, was dismantled and certainly not uh, operating at its full potential. Um, I think the steps we've made as, as a city, uh, we're going in the right direction. But also, I believe that the current local law that we have. And this is why I think uh, between Dawn and myself trying to understand how we would sort of set these positions in place, et cetera, where uh, there's some overlap with what the current law already says, right? And where there is an MWB officer as a direct report to the commissioner, the MWB director direct report to the mayor. And I think the challenge that we're trying to understand is then what, how is this other position fills into all that on top of what's already codified in law and the law also mandates our procedures. Um, the MWB officers are responsible for for the procurement plans, they're responsible for the utilization plans, they're responsible for contract compliance, all these things that we're very much uh, aware of and are concerned about and so again that we're just we just need to figure out how this will be operationalized and then lastly I say uh, you know the commitment um, you know, varies obviously from individual to individual and, 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 and uh, uh, agency head to agency head, but, but I think the centralization of the MWB director in the mayor's office, uh, where, where they all report into currently, that's the current structure, 
I think that gives us the, the breath and, and to do what we've done uh, over the last several years. We're, we're not clearly there yet because we can't erase uh, historic discrimination, um, institutionalized discrimination, uh, sexism, uh, racism, all that within the procurement system and also in the marketplace. That's something we haven't talked about here. In the marketplace, uh, these MWBEs have to deal with, with issues with trying to get loans, trying to get bonds, trying to get insurance, paying more for everybody else. So when they actually uh, bid for us uh, here at the city, maybe they're, they're not bidding as the best uh, way that they can because they have to deal with all this extra money they have to pay out to get the services that they need in order to bid to us. I mean, it's a, it's a cycle of, of, of discrimination that we're fighting against. And, and so we've implemented several things from the mayor's office, such as low interest loan funds, a bond collateral assistance program uh, for our MWB developers funding there, went to the private sector, raised money from the private sector, our banks, uh, our depository banks, to the tunes of tens of millions, and put it all in a pool that serves the MWB. And that's what we're doing now because we have the leverage from the mayor's office to do that. So again, I think um, we are happy to, to continue the discussion, but there's a lot happening here, and a lot of this is already in the law, as we're particularly quarterly reporting that is mandated also by the by the by the council. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I'll stop there. But certainly, we, we we're continuing to explore with our with our colleagues. I just, Madam Chair, I wanted to give an operationalized example. So the way you operationalize is you get a chief diversity officer, you have it report directly. Let's say let's take it at a city agency to a commissioner. That chief diversity officer will have, let's say, the MWB officer right under them. That way, that MWB officer gets to talk about what they saw, what market they saw, what market analysis they saw. So in my office, that's what we do. I have Brian, who's sitting here with us today. He goes over a market analysis. He looks at the patterns. He looks at the scope of work for every RFP. And when Brian is done with that RFP, he says, hey, Wendy, I know we've traditionally looked at this RFP in this way, in this way, in this way, but state law is blocking us from seeing X, Y, and Z. I take that to the controller and I say, I found the pattern and it's impacting every single bureau in this office. The other thing Brian does is that he looks at availability across the board. And if there is MW availability through the lens of a marketplace, because he's an MWB officer, I go back to the controller and say, this RFP will definitely have a target. If at any point there is someone in my office that says, I don't really want to do that because last year this is how we did it. My stature in the office, the fact that I'm an executive, can help override or can help us come to a conclusion on what is the best for that office. I can only do that because I sit with every other executive in my office. Brian, as an MWB officer, does a great job, and he does what many MWB officers do, but they can't, they can't create policy. And while I agree with Janelle that they do great and wonderful work, they don't impact policy, and a CDO allows for that to happen. And I'll point a clarification to my colleague. The MWB officers, as stipulated in the law, are deputy commissioners, meaning they are executive, and they're in the executive branch of every single agency. So that's, I just want to make that clarification. They are executive members of the cabinet of every agency. Ma Madam Chair, uh, in the interest of time, I'd, I'd like to just leave the, the council, the commission, with, with this thought. Let's, instead of starting at the starting line, let's start at the finish line and talk about a CDO being in place and work backwards from that. Once you agree to the principle of codifying it, these are details that can be worked out. The legislation doesn't exist. The, the, the proposal does not exist in stone. What it, what it needs to do is to take into consideration what you've heard today and present a proposal that, that is uh, satisfy your requirements. But the bottom line has to be that we need a charter uh, revision CDO, and we need it now. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Reverend, I, I respect uh, your position. I, I just uh, I'm of the opposite mindset. You see, we're in a big mess in this city because, in part, not because of, but in part, because we have a voluminous charter that over the years has been used over and over again to layer more and more complexity into an already complex municipal corporation. We have designated deputy mayors, at, uh, de deputy commissioners and agencies. 
Uh, we've designated any number of different things over the years. And what we have found is that an executive comes in and a city council comes in and they ignore it. You can mandate a deputy commissioner for X, Y, and Z all you want in the charter. But if you have an unwilling chief executive and a lackluster city council not doing oversight, that deputy mayoralty, or that deputy commissionership in that agency with that particular oversight uh, responsibility gets lost. You I think what's needed is not the general theme. Diversity is critical. It's the lifeblood of this city. We are as diverse a, a city as exists anywhere, and that's part of the greatness of the city. But shouldn't we talk with greater specificity about the specifics before mandating, enshrining in our local constitution, and this is for all of you, the notion of something that is a moving target. There's a lot of diversity of opinion on this subject right at that table, as I'm sure there is right here. I, uh, I take a point with what the chair said. This absolutely could be done by local law. This could be done by executive order. The, 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 the Department of Administrative Services, uh, uh, the um, ACS, we went through this with ACS. We created it through the executive order, and then years later, after ironing out all the details, and after the council and the mayor went back and forth, and after scandal after scandal, we decided to put it before the voters and say, now it's ready for the people to decide if it's charter ready. I think the great concern we have is not with the laudable goal. The end is you have to be out of your mind to disagree with the end. But the means, the means are critical. And my concern is we're always too quick to come up with a catchy title and then try to ram it into the charter. And then we're left very disappointed when nothing happens. And our city has a history of that. So I would, I'd like to just ask all of you, uh, could you talk to us about Local Law 12? And before you do that, you know, the Department of General Services used to exist. It was changed to the Department of Citywide Administrative, Citywide Administrative Services. They've got great people there. They've got great leadership there. Isn't that a great nexus or a great place where the nexus should happen. You know, there are rules and regulations and all sorts of things. I read some in one of the testimonies the word holistic, that there's a concern that DCAS wouldn't take a holistic approach, when in fact DCAS is a citywide entity, a charter agency that is citywide taking a holistic approach. Just back up a bit and, and could you speak to us about Local Law 12, which isn't even on online yet, right? It was just passed. What impact would that have on the feasibility of a concept like this going forward? Well, from a DCAS perspective, um, Local Law 12 specifically speaks to the current structure we have in place. It calls for um, an Office of Equity and Inclusion, which is currently housed at DCAS, and the law specifically says that this office should be housed at DCAS. It also calls for a chief to serve um, to lead workplace and workforce equity efforts. And then there are um, very specific um, requirements specifically relating to reporting, which ties into the workforce data that we provide to city agencies already. It talks about providing um, underutilization information across job categories. Um, there's a section that talks about providing um, pay analysis and equity information. Um, there are also um, aspects of it that um, specifically refer to retirement eligibility, um, tenure of employees. All of these data points are currently collected by DCAS, and we provide that information to EEO officers in um, three different uh, from deep, three different data sources. We issue a workforce profile report um, where most of that information is um, compiled. We conduct comparisons to the New York City employable workforce um, in that particular report. We also provide the federal EEO 4 report that's required by the EEOC to agencies, as well as another report that's specifically pulled from our complaint tracking database. So essentially local law enshrines 
the work that we are currently doing specifically relating to reporting, but also ensuring that there is a chief who is charged with working with every EEO officer across the city who reports to DCAS. And Commissioner, are you aware of the status of the, the, those chiefs at this moment? Is it, I think it's in May that this actually takes effect, right? Yes, it actually takes effect. But we worked with the council to have um, the, the law reflect the work that we had already, you know, been doing. Um, and, and that was intentional because there was a lot that um, I think that folks assumed about what we were and were not doing. And we had the opportunity to really um, highlight the work that we've done specifically around investigations and compliance, workforce data sharing and collection, also providing agencies with the tools they need to promote equity within the workplace. So we made a conscious shift to not just focus on compliance, but also to offer a program um, and to provide um, an expanded service portfolio portfolio to our EEO um, counterparts across the city. Honorable, I, I, I see it a little differently, uh, and, and I respect your views, but uh, a couple of things. One, uh, for 20 years, the city of New York had an MWBE spend of less than 3%. So the recent uh, accomplishments are transitory if we can't codify it, number one. Number two, uh, I believe in the people. And, and talk about a mediocre city council and negligent executives, um, I trust the people. And so I believe that the c people with this commission have the capacity to craft a, a, a proposal for the, uh, for the election or the vote in November. And so uh, there, are, there have always been fits and starts towards progress, but we're not going satis to be satisfied with status quo when we can have excellence. New York has always led the nation in innovative public policy, and I think you have the opportunity to continue our leadership role. I would and just add that there are cities across the nation that are already doing this. You look at Chicago, they have a chief diversity officer, and they're looking at it from the perspective of it being at, at the top. You look at small, small states like Tennessee, Nashville, and they have chief diversity officers looking at this at the top. And a lot of their chief diversity officers are part of their governance mandate. So this is not, uh, this is, this is, while, while this is not a topic that I think it, it's, for me it's not so much about clarification, it's really about us having the will to make this sustainable. And I think the charter allows us to do that. When we put it in the charter, 40 years from now, we know it will still exist. I don't know what's going to happen to the program 10 years from now. I don't know if, if it's going to be accountable. Johnnell's doing a great job, but guess what? What if another Johnnell comes in and he doesn't want to do a good job or she doesn't want to do a good job? Where do we find the accountability in the city of New York? We're asking you to give us that accountability, to let the voters decide what that is. And 10 years from now, we'll still have a chief diversity officer. We'll have a more robust EEO program. We'll have a more robust uh, MWB program. And we can secure that now. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions? I'd like to thank all the panelists for their participation and for the robust conversation. Um, I'm sure that there will be some additional questions and concerns that are raised for one of you or many of you. And I would like to thank you for coming and spending the time with us and sharing your expertise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. We're now very happy to be joined by Richard Richard Brefault. Brefault, yeah. Or Brefault. Brefault. Which is the... Brefault, sorry. Who serves as chair of the New York City Conflict of Interest Board. Please go ahead and share your comments, and then we'll open it up to commissioner questions. Great. This is this is on. Okay, great. Uh, members of the Charter Revision Commission, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Richard Rafault. I am the chair of the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board. I want to say a few words about the work and structure of the board, and after that I'd be very happy to answer any questions you may have. The mission of the board, which was created by the 1987 Charter Revision Commission, is to protect the integrity of our city government and to help assure our citizens that their government is worthy of their trust. The board administers the conflicts of interest provisions of the charter, the annual disclosure law, the lobbyist gift law, the affiliated not-for-profits law, and the legal defense trust law. Much of the board's work consists of education and training for the city's more than 300,000 public servants. The board also responds to requests for advice, both formal and informal, from current and former public servants, and issues formal orders and opinions, promulgates rules, and prosecutes alleged violators through administrative proceedings. The board consists of five public members appointed by the mayor, subject to the advice and consent of the council, to staggered six-year terms, and members eligible for reappointment for one additional term. The only qualifications the charter sets for appointments are that members are chosen for their independence, integrity, civic commitment, and high ethical standards. However, the Charter also sharply restricts the outside activities of members, effectively limiting the ability of board members to participate in city politics. No member of the board may hold any other public office, seek election to any public office, be a public employee, or appear as a lobbyist before the city. The day-to-day -day operations of the board are handled by a staff of 26, divided roughly equally among the units responsible for education and training, legal advice, enforcing the conflicts rules, and administering the disclosure law. I've got some data in, the, in my comments, which can also be found on our annual report, going through the large number of informal requests for advice, our opinions, our enforcement actions, the number of disclosures we handle, uh, classes, et cetera. Uh, and this year in particular, a new initiative following the directive of council legislation, we have been doing a lot of rulemaking to codify our prior rules, uh, codify our prior interpretations and formal rules. Uh, we've completed five and are beginning nine, and we are a very lean operation with an annual budget of a little over two and a half million dollars. Uh, a couple of questions have been raised about the membership of the board. Uh, the current members believe that our current structure works very well. Our small size facilitates deliberation and action. The combination of mayoral appointment and council confirmation, both for initial appointment and any reappointment, assures that any issues about any nomination can be publicly aired and addressed. Not having multiple appointing officers or a political distribution requirement eliminates the concern that a member would view him or herself as representing a particular appointing officer or party, a fragmentation that has affected the work of many other ethics agencies, such as New York State's JCOPE. We are not and have not been a political body. Charter tells us to stay out of politics, and we do. Two of the current members of the board were initially appointed by Mayor Bloomberg, but have been reappointed or have been continued by Mayor de Blasio. The three others were appointed by Mayor de Blasio. We have each been before the council for confirmation, some more than once. We come from a variety of backgrounds, city service, the private sector, and academia. This is not to say the current structure is the only one possible, but it does seem to work. But just one more thing about our structure, the charter it authorizes the board to appoint a council. We now use the term executive director who supervises the board's day-to-day -day operations and works for the board. Accountability to the board serves to assure that both the executive director and her staff are independent of the political process. The current structure allows the executive director to develop expertise and a deep understanding of the law and how it works in the countless situations in which it has to be applied. We think it's a good combination of accountability, independence, and expertise. Finally, uh, the commission has indicated that one of the possibilities before it has been transferring the regulation of lobbying from the city clerk to the campaign finance board or to the COIB. We currently enforce the gifts provisions of the city's administrative code that apply to lobbyists. We have no position concerning the expansion of that role with respect to lobbyists so long as the necessary additional staff and budget would be provided. And I'm very happy to take any questions about this or any other issues that relate to the functioning of the board. Yeah. Sal. Uh, good evening. Uh, just just uh, a couple couple of questions. One, uh, you state that that uh, representing a particular appointing officer or party uh, 
uh, it has fragment a fragmentation has affected the work of other ethics ethics agencies such as New York State's J. Cope. Uh, but it, you were, you were appointed by the mayor, right? And and you you do rule on things that impact the mayor. I right. mean, isn't isn't that an inherent uh, conflict? I think because we all have appointed and confirmed the same way, we don't think of ourselves as in some sense representing different interests. I mean, some institutions it's appropriate to have that. Uh, this, your commission, I think it makes a lot of sense to have things from different parts of city government. I think the way we work is we really are, uh, it helps us to be internally cohesive and to be sort of collectively um, independent of everybody, to be honest, uh, is that we don't see ourselves as working for anyone in particular, but for the city as a whole. And I think if uh, it's difficult for me to talk about specific cases, except for those that have been in the public record. But I think it's fair to say that if you look at what we've done over the last few years, we have managed to impose, uh, do things that have not been, that the mayor might not have wanted, that city commissioners certainly didn't want when, when fines were imposed, that the council may not have wanted, uh, that the, some DAs didn't want, because we also have some authority over them. I think that we, I think it's fair to say that we have been able to show that we have been independent. Um, and I think, and I, but I do think part of that is the sense of kind of cohesion of commitment because we're not, there's, there's no temptation to think, well, I represent the such and such position. We all represent the same position, which is the city, so, and we're all subject to the same process. So you would not be in favor of the city council or the, the uh, public advocate or uh, the borough presidents having an appointee uh, to the Conflicts of Interest Board? I mean, I'm tempted to say I have a Conflicts of Interest because I've, I'm here under the current situation. So, uh, and the board discussed this recently. We, had a, we actually had a discussion about what I should be saying and what the board's view on this is. I think the, the way I would put it is we think the current system works pretty well. And I think my approach is a, it's a kind of an if it ain't broke, don't fix it approach. I'm, I'm not saying that there would be something terribly wrong with another change, I, but I do think it works well. Uh, I do think j is a caution. Uh, I think everyone would agree that that does not work well on the way that's been set up. Um, and you know, I, I trust your judgment on this, but I think our view on this is that in and, and not just the current board, but I think going back, the, well, I guess we came into existence for rough, uh, the, I guess roughly 1990, the 87 Charter Commission, until it got going. Uh, so now we've been in existence for close to 30 years. Two, more, think, two more quick questions. Sure. Uh, the, uh, uh, presently, the law states that when you leave, when elected officials leave government service, they're prohibited from lobbying for one year. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I'm of the view that it should be a lifetime ban or a five-year uh, ban. Uh, we've seen a lot of ethical issues surface as a result of that. Uh, has the board uh, taken a position on something like that? Have you reviewed it? Have you discussed it? In some sense, we're, in that sense, we're not a policy-making body. The answer is no. We have not taken a position on that. Do you have a, you have a view on it? Um, I think there's no magic hour, no magic year. I mean, just just one slight correction. Uh, I think for certain senior city officials, it's a, it's a two-year ban. Uh, but you're right. For the vast majority of city officials, it's a one-year ban with respect to their former agency and a lifetime ban with respect to anything they were specifically involved in. Um, I look at uh, the federal rule. Uh, for some, it's one. For some, it's two. Uh, for the Senate, U.S. Senate, it's two. I think most agencies around the country use either one or two. I think there are a handful of very senior federal officials in national security or international trade where it's four. Um, so there's, you know, you, you've got to balance, I guess, the, the integrity of the system, which I think is very valuable, with to what extent would this discourage high quality people from going into government. Um, there's no magic place to set the balance, some one year, two years. Uh, the further out you go, the more you raise the, the concern that some people will be discouraged from entering public service. Because they can't become lobbyists? Well, because it might interfere with what they do afterwards. I mean, some people come into public service having had certain uh, track records in the private sector or the not-for-profit sector. I mean, a lot of the, I mean, the lobbying that's done in New York City is also done by the not-for-profit sector. Oh. Not-for-profit sector oh. in New York City is huge. And so uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, ex it's all one way or the other. Oh. I think. I think it's yeah. right to, to have some kind of uh, cooling off period. It could be longer. Um, how long it should be, um, I've, I don't have a strong view on it. Well, we, we, our founding fathers, as you know, when they, when they developed our Constitution, thought of uh, public service, elected positions as a uh, 
you know, as, as a vocation, and then they went back to their prior occupation, whatever it was. Now we seem to be moving into the direction where being an elected official is really a, the low bar for many folks going into public service, and, and they really ain't to be lobbyists who then go out and earn millions of dollars because they're lobbying their, their, their past colleagues. I mean, it's a philosophical question. I don't expect you to answer it, but uh, I've got some real concerns about it. That's why I think we, we're seeing members of, mm -hmm. of the Senate and the House proposing real anti-corruption mm -hmm. measures right now in, in D.C., and I think we need to go in that direction. We've seen scandals here in the city as well. And one final question. Madam Chair, if I may, one final question. The, uh, the, New York, under the New York City uh, campaign finance law, lobbyists can only contribute $400, but they can go out and bundle tons of money. I, I, I mean, how is, that, how, is that, how is that not a major conflict? And why is that allowed? Oh, the campaign finance law is a little bit outside my wheelhouse right here, but um, I turn it back. I mean, I, whether it's in the charter or through ordinary legislation, clearly the bundling can be regulated. Uh, there's no uh, absolute ban on doing that. I mean, there's no constitutional prohibition on regulating bundling that I'm aware of. And whether it's, uh, I mean, I was, I was here during the prior panel, and I know there was some, a really good discussion, I think, about what belongs in a charter and what could be done by local law, uh, that you could do it as a hybrid. Uh, well, the funny thing about it is lobbyists cannot provide gifts to legislators, to government mm -hmm. officials. <laughs> Yet we have a campaign finance law where you can go out uh, and lobbyists are bundling fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 for people running for office. That we have a, what, a $50 gift ban? I mean, is it, is it, and this is kind of incongruous in my opinion, but uh, hopefully we can address it. Um, I just had a question for you about the constituency of the commission. I note that in other locations, many times there were requirements, um, whether it's professional or representative. Um, you said that you weren't opposed to them, but you didn't see a need for it. Mm -hmm. Do you think it could add to the work of the board if it if the constituency was always guaranteed to be spread across a fairly wide spectrum? Um, a couple of things. One is uh, the size question. How big are we talking about? Because I do think uh, at some point, it be, depending on, what, obviously constituency is a word that covers a lot of ground. So that there are multiple different kinds of constituencies. The broader you make the body, the harder it may be for it to reach decisions. Uh, to make judgments, to enforce, to interpret, advise, and enforce the law, which is a lot of what we do. So that's, I mean, it's, it's similar to the point about how long should the cooling off period be. There's, period be. There's no magic number. Uh, five has been a good size because it allows us to deliberate but also reach decisions and to try and keep on a, a reasonably tight schedule of giving advice and reaching and concluding adjudications and going through rulemaking. So that's a good right. one. But I'm not necessarily yeah. talking about expanding right. the size no, no, no. of the board. I'm talking mm -hmm. about potentially if there were requirements that, right. let's say, one person had to be an attorney with a right. record in this area, right. that another person had to be a I mean, uh, not-for-profit executive who... I'd have to think about it some more. I mean, I do think, uh, I think we're all attorneys. Certainly, what, we do a yeah. lot of legal work in our meetings. So uh, the ones who aren't attorneys are doing a good job faking it because uh, there's, there's a high level of legal analysis that does go on. So I, I don't know if it's always been the case. There have been board members before I came onto the board. I've been there not quite I think quite there was years. a member who was a minister. That's quite, quite possible. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know that you need to require it. Obviously, people bring judgments and insights from all sorts of fields. Um, I suspect it helps, uh, but I wouldn't call it essential. Um, in terms of some, um, I, I think there, I guess my major concern would be churning people. Uh, I think there's a, the plus side is what you suggest, is guaranteeing that different perspectives are there. The downside is, I think, would be converting people into representatives of the constituency group. Um, I mean, right now it does have, it, and it is the case, we've had people from the private sector, the public sector, academia, some of the private sector lawyers in the past have had labor practices. Attorneys. I'm sorry? I said, but they're all attorneys. 
For now, yeah. Um, it might be helpful. I don't know. Uh, I'm a lawyer myself. I teach, I yeah. teach in law school. I'm maybe I'm biased on I, this. I'm not uh, a lawyer. Um, um, but we do have that profession amply represented on mm. this board, I think. Mm. Would all the lawyers like to raise their hand? Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say no. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I, I was just curious. Yeah. I, I'm, I, it's not like those some other fields where I think, like the City Planning Commission, it helps to have people with a planning background. It might be, is there some bodies, a well, Landmarks and, Preservation Commission people with an architecture background or well, some to, background in To Sal's question, it might be helpful to have an ethicist yeah. or a minister yeah, or I, someone else who looks at the questions yeah. of conflict of yeah. interest and ethics from a different background of knowledge and philosophy. Just a thought. I, I don't really disagree, but the only thing I would just say one more time and I'll stop is a lot of what we do is an interpret and enforce the law. We do bring enforcement actions and we do make we do engage in things that resemble adjudication as well as rulemaking. You don't have to be a lawyer to do that, but I do think it helps. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fiella. Thank you. Uh, Chair Member Fault, thank you for attending tonight. Um, I have three areas of inquiry. The first, you uh, use the phrase a, a cooling off period for uh, uh, officials who leave government. I'm wondering, are there any additional officials or city employees not presently uh, affected by that cooling off period that, that the board thinks uh, might benefit from being brought into that fold? I think the current law actually covers everybody. Okay. It covers everybody subject to our jurisdiction. It is targeted in terms of you, uh, the former employee, the former public servant, uh, cannot appear before. We don't, it's not, not restricted to lobbying. It, it covers more broadly appearances and communication with their former agency. Uh, and there's some issues to how agencies define very full. Remember, the council will be the council, for example, for somebody in um, uh, the Department of Finance or the Department of Finance. So, but I believe it covers everybody. Okay. Well, that sounds like it's sufficiently expansive. Then. Right. Um, <laughs> two, um, my recollection, and, I, and don't hold me to the exact figures, I think it was 2010, the last Charter Commission raised from 10000 to 25000 the ability to uh, levy the fines. The argument made by Coib at the time was, I think it was 88 or something, mm -hmm. that it hadn't grown with inflation. We're almost a decade removed now. Is the fine sufficient? We only rarely actually get to the high fine. Uh, we do try and uh, calibrate the fine to the nature of the violation, to the, also to some extent to the seriousness, to the, to the, the level of the employee. Um, uh, we haven't really focused on it. I think I wouldn't, I'm not inclined to, I, I wouldn't be opposed to some indexing of that number. Um, but um, I don't know that we often hit the max. Um, this, uh, the, board, the board isn't making a formal appeal no, saying that this no. is, this is a, uh, uh, this is, prevents good oversight because the, the number's too I, I too don't think that is, low. we have felt that to be a problem. Okay. And, um, Finally, there's always this debate about independence, mm -hmm. you know, not only of your body but of all. Uh, I uh, pretty amazed. Two point five million dollars is your annual budget. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you use the word; um, it's it's fairly modest. Lean, I think, is the word I. It, it yeah. sure is. Yeah. Uh, a blink of an eye in, 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 in government today, and the number of staff. I'm curious about budget cycle time. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you've been chair for how long now? Uh, almost five years. Five years. So you've gone through five budget cycles. Uh, when the annual dance takes place, does COIB fall in, 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 in the same line as a lot of entities where you get this drastic cut and then you're having to kind of fight to get back to where you were? Uh, um, because that speaks to a degree of independence, doesn't it? Uh, yes, my executive director is here, and she would have a better be better able to answer that. I think it is fair to say our budget has been flat for several years, so um, I don't know that we have been threatened. Uh, but I do. I, I, we have in the past, and as, as prior commissions, to uh, and if I lock in the budget, to lock in to give us a, a protected budget, which I think would be either 
uh, the current level adjusted for inflation or a fixed percentage of the city budget, it would be, as you suggest, practically a rounding error what we actually are, but well, do you, at least to commit to that. On that subject, yeah. do, you, do you have that uh, a fixed percentage of the city budget? Right. Uh, is it a particular agency or the overall city budget? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I haven't. I don't. So if I, I don't want to put you on the spot uh, on that, if if, if you, you and the executive director we might could, want to forward that yeah. to the executive director of the Charter Commission. I think a thinking would be, in some sense, to take where we are now and take it as a uh, the current budget would be the numerator. We, the denominator would be the overall budget, or which could be the overall budget. And so just, it would be point zero 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 right, zero but, something. But okay. as uh, the city budget has tended to grow, and um, <laughs> I think it's more about protection. Uh, I don't believe we've been threatened, but um, we are the agents. We're not the only agency, but we are the agency that oversees the people who write our budget. Yeah, that's why I um, think perhaps you've got the yeah. degree of independence yeah. that a lot of people would envy. So right. I thank you. I thank the entity for their work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jim, I believe you had a question. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I wanted to follow up on that. Uh, if you could get us, or your staff could get us, you know, uh, your training obligations were greatly increased, I mm -hmm. think, in the 2010 everybody. commission. Yeah. Uh, so since that time, have your numbers of uh, complaints taken in, advisory opinions issued, uh, increased as a result of that and ha and your budget stayed flat. If we could see those numbers, uh, that might be helpful to deciding, you know, the need for and any if, if we think you need a, a fixed budget and a level that maybe that should be fixed at. We will get you those numbers. I think uh, certainly the numbers went up sharply after 2010. They haven't gone they, they, they continue to rise. They haven't gone up so sharply in the last couple of years, but I do think we've been at, this year was either the highest or the next highest for, on most of the metrics of what we do, uh, our budget. Um, but I think the big jump was earlier. Um, our budget is higher than it was in 2010, uh, but it has been, I know, for the last three years, it's been relative, it's well, literally flat for the last two and relatively flat for the last three. We can get you more numbers on that. Um, Thank you. Any other, right. Any other questions? Then I would like to thank you for coming to speak with us and for sharing with us your experience. Um, and with that, um, our next forum will be on Monday, March 18th at 6 p.m. at City Hall on several governance-related topics, including the role of the public advocate the law department and the overall structure and balance of power in city government. With that, the business of today's meeting has been concluded. Commissioners, while you're more than welcome to take your written materials with you, please remember to leave your folders and your name cards behind so that we can recycle. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much for coming. Sorry about that. No, I, I realized as I started talking that my clarifying was not actually clarifying. It was to the thing it's shale. And then after I started talking, that I realized it. This is another. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, no, the 18th, we move to Thursday and next Monday. Or the following Monday on the land use. Oh, the forum. Correct. Yeah.